Finding the truth. Government's lie. Misleading the public. You must start as a journalist with the assumption that they are lying to you. One of the great reporters of the 20th century, I.F. Stone, told journalism students never to forget that all governments lie. He could speak with authority, having spent seven decades exposing deception and official lies by digging deep into government documents and transcripts. I, I often think of I.F. Stone as the nation's first blogger. He really embodied this cantankerous, disruptive, insurgent energy that I think has come to be the defining attribute of political blogging at its best. He gained his greatest fame and impact publishing the newsletter I.F. Stone's Weekly taking on McCarthyism, racism in the military, and the Vietnam War. Will you welcome this marvelous journalist, Mr. I.F. Stone? We, we haven't been able to get it through our heads that this is a political war. What you have to ask yourself is, why is it that here are Vietnamese on one side, on our side, and here are the same Vietnamese on the other side. And on one side, they have very little in the way of arms, they have no air force, no napalm, no big boom boom, and they really fight magnificently. And on our side, you have five times as many troops, all that equipment, all that firepower, all that artillery, and they're not worth a damn. Why is this? Because the men on the other side feel they're fighting for freedom. They're fighting for freedom from, from domination by the white man and by the Westerner. There are a few people that I can think of in American history that better represented uh, the best journalism in a democratic society than I.F. Stone. Somebody had recommended highly that I begin reading what I.F. Stone's journalism was about and sent me a couple of links. And I read the first two and I was so blown away by them. I just instantly became almost an addict of the newsletters and found online a repository of all of his newsletters and just began reading one after the next and didn't stop until a month later when I had read, I don't know, not dozens, but probably hundreds. I can draw a line from Eye of Stone directly to what I'm doing now, because I, I, he played, though I, I didn't know him at the time, he played such an important role in inspiring me to think a different way. There's several dozen ways to cover this capital. You, you can sit up in the press club and cover it off the press release table. You can play ball with the, with the administration and, and the cabinet members and get it that way. You can be a heretic the way I am and get it that way. 29-year-old high school dropout says he is the source of those leaks about the government's secret surveillance programs. The identity of the man who sent the Obama administration into defend and explain mode this week. His name is Edward Snowden. And he knows the U.S. will try to catch him and put him in prison. How did Snowden find you? When did he reach out to you? Glenn Greenwald is the journalist responsible for releasing the information leaked by Edward Snowden. He joins us from Rio. Good evening, Glenn Greenwald. Um, first of all, why should Good you evening. be the arbiter about what is in the public interest and what is vital to national security? I'm not the arbiter of that. I work with a huge number of Guardian editors and some of the most experienced national security journalists in the world. I consider Glenn Greenwald the closest thing we have to a living, breathing IF Stone. Would you be prepared to return to their rightful owners such files as are currently in your possession? The rightful owners of the information in these documents are the American people who paid for them and whose government should not have been hiding these programs from them. What I want is somebody that can lay up some plans to trap these guys and uh, whoop hell out of them, kill some of them. That's what I want to do. A classic example of I.F. Stone's ability to ferret out something when no one else was doing it was the Gulf of Tonkin excuse for going into Vietnam. I'll try and bring something back that will meet that objective. Give up. My fellow Americans, renewed hostile actions against the United States ships on the high seas in the Gulf of Tonkin have today required me to order the military forces of the United States to take action and reply. Three weeks after we had the so-called attack 
by the North Vietnamese. Izzy read all the after reports and he said, where, where is the debris? If we had been hit, why isn't there more being talked about? And he said there were all kinds of excuses why this little tiny country would go against the largest fleet in the world, except the fact that it might have been provoked. If the mainstream media had followed Izzy, uh, we might not have had that 10-year disaster. Izzy was debunking the fictions coming out of government as soon as they came out. He did it week after week around the Vietnam War. So the beauty of Izzy, I think the lesson that independent journalists learn from Izzy today, is not to be complicit in the official fiction, to start fighting through the cover stories on day one. What the weekly, his weekly taught me was that it, it didn't need to be fancy. It didn't need to have a lot of production value. It just needed to tell the truth and to tell me things that I'm not gonna learn any place else. My father really believed in the importance of a free press. He once told me, if something goes wrong with the government, a free press will ferret it out and it will get fixed. But if something goes wrong with the free press, the country will go straight to hell. You saw the U.S. forces take the bullets out of the body? Jeremy Scahill. This designation is a tremendous honor, and I want to pledge to use this opportunity to educate a new generation of young journalists about the incredibly important work of I.F. Stone. This isn't a career, this isn't a profession. Um, journalism is a way of life. I got to meet I.F. Stone in the mid-80s in Washington, D.C. I wanted to put out my own weekly, Morris Weekly, and I just wanted to go and talk to him about it. And it was, it was just an amazing um, afternoon that I got to have with him to really kind of pick his brain and, and tell him you know, what I wanted to do. And, and he gave me you know, good advice. His great motto of all governments are run by liars and nothing they say should be believed. And he said, he said to me, but, but I've ex I would expand that now to governments, corporations. <laughs> you know, it's not just the, uh, the government, it's, it's, it's that anybody in power. A lot of times, some of the worst truths are hidden in plain sight. And that, and that the point of a, of a journalist is to try to dig through what is intentionally an overwhelming mountain of bureaucracy. And that's what, that's what Izzy Stone was just a master at. This is the typewriter on which my father typed with two fingers. So how long was he using this typewriter for? Well, as long as I can remember, really. It's, uh, it's amazing that he would type with two fingers, so he never, he never learned how to type with... Uh... He wasn't very mechanical. In fact, uh, our cars kept uh, f breaking down because he never changed the oil. <laughs> now, if you're a journalist doing that kind of work, your computer could be hacked. Be very difficult to hack uh, I.F. Stone's typewriter. So usually if you want to pursue independent journalism, you, you start your own blog, you do it on your own, or you use the I.F. Stone model in his time, which was to create your own newsletter and rely on reader subscription that lets you eke out a living, but not really build a meaningful news organization. But one of the things I've learned over the last 10 months in doing the Snowden reporting is that if you really want to do sustained investigative reporting, against the largest political and corporate factions, you actually do need funding. It is a necessary evil. You need lawyers to protect you and technologists to enable the work and researchers and editors and other journalists who are gonna work with you. You know, it's one of those insane stories in, in, in life and in the context of media culture where we're all struggling to figure out how to pay uh, for journalism, something extraordinary happened. And that is that Glenn gets this email from a mutual friend 
of his and Pierre Omidyar. And I had never heard of Pierre Omidyar. And it turns out that Pierre Omidyar was the founder of eBay and uh, something like the 120th richest man in the world. We Googled him and we, you know, he was worth like $9 billion. And this friend had said, you know, Pierre wants to talk to you, Glenn, about potentially working with him on a media organization he wants to start. Glenn Greenwald has been a lightning rod for controversy since he obtained those secret NSA documents from Ed Snowden and published some of them in The Guardian. Now he's launching a media company backed by wealthy eBay founder Pierre Omidyar. We really wanted to create a model that took the virtues of both worlds and to build a news organization that at its core was designed to empower journalists to pursue their journalistic passion the way that they wanted to, that led them into journalism in the first place. And to me, that might even be the spirit of I.F. Stone more than anything else, which was that the essence of his journalism was that he was beholden to nobody. We see this work that we're doing and that other people are doing um, as part of the tradition of I have stone. Well, I mean, if you had to come up with a slogan for what our new media venture is, the one that Jeremy Scahill and Laura Poitras and I are, are, are building under the aegis of First Look Media, you probably could use as a slogan, the spirit of I have stone, but funded with $250 million. <laughs> Here in El Majula, despite the official denial, they'd left their fingerprints strewn across the desert. The Vietnam War has been a terrible defeat for all the brand names we believe in, for General Electric and General Motors and AT&T, for all the great corporations, all the great industries that do the push buttons. When they turn to war, they know how to kill people en masse. And here down in the jungle, way below, is a strange creature that we can't crush. This strange animal we can't kill. It's time to look closely at it and see by God, it's a human being. We have to begin to enjoy the differences in the human family. But either we learn to uh, live together uh, or we die together.